Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for coming back from the photo. I realize it's the end of the day, but we're going to have a quite exciting dialogue. There's no slides in this next hour. It's just people sharing from the point of view of the commercial perspective. We, of course, have had excellent discussion hearing different angles and just spent a lot of time thinking about different countries' point of view. So my name is Danielle Wood, and I serve as a professor leading a group called the Space Enabled Research Group at the MIT Media Lab. I also hold an appointment in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT. Our work in Space Enabled is twofold. We spend a lot of our time asking, how are we using technology from space to help address the sustainable development goals? How many of you know the sustainable development goals? How many of you use them in any part of your work to say, I'm working on a particular SDG? I think actually what's neat about it is the SDGs talk about sustainable development on our planet, particularly in our oceans, our atmosphere, and our land. And of course, we don't yet have a globally adopted sustainable development vision for Earth orbit. But we are the people who might be the ones to kind of put that together. So I, I encourage us to take the example of the Sustainable Development Goals, which is a visionary statement with 17 high-level goals and 169 quantifiable uh, targets. We could do something like that in the future, uh, also for Earth orbit, because it's a, the next generation of challenge we are all taking on as the global community. And then we can have more dialogue between those doing sustainable development on the planet and those also in the atmosphere and beyond. Today, I also want to highlight uh, activity that my team is doing, along with collaborators in the room. So thank you, Stan Lemons, for being here from ESA. I also want to give a shout out to Mariba. We are working together in an international consortium, including the World Economic Forum, ESA, UT Austin, MIT, and Bryce Space and Technology. Together, we're creating a system called the Space Sustainability Rating. I hope some of you have heard of it. Maybe you've heard of this in recent news or congressional hearings, or uh, thanks to Jeff Faust for giving us shout-outs in Space News. Uh, this is an ongoing activity that really came out of the dialogue of the Global Future Council on Space Technology, uh, hosted by the World Economic Forum. I want to give them credit for convening people like you and people who are not here today uh, to ask what are the key challenges facing our community that the commercial sector might want to take a leadership role in, not just from government activity. And looking around at the proposed launches, especially with large-scale launches, part of the goal was to say, can we incentivize voluntary behavior by commercial actors to do their best, given their constraints and their business model, to be responsible actors in space? So there's a competition process, and uh, our teams have been selected to help implement what will be the space sustainability rating. It's not just an academic exercise, it's going to be a real operational process, and that's why we're glad to speak to all of you and to companies about what is possible. What can we put down on paper that then incentivizes and gives a reward and an appreciation that celebrates the choices that operators make, no matter their size or budget, there's something they can do to make their mission more sustainable. That means they can try to make it easier to identify where their satellites are in orbit, they can share that data in a responsible way with their government or with other operators. They can also think about physical design parameters to make it easier to track where the satellites are, whether they're working or not. They can think about their operational approaches, how they react during times of needing to coordinate. And they can think about how much uh, assurance they have that the satellite will be able to deorbit or go to a safe and non-threatening location in the long term. So there's many choices designers have. And what I reflect on is that as an aerospace engineer, when I was trained to build satellites, no one taught me, make your satellite as low risk for collisions as possible. That wasn't one of my design requirements. But these days, those sitting here on the panel are starting to make that part of their normal business. So it's a new era, and we have new design requirements to celebrate for our students up to our seasoned professionals. And we'll talk a bit about the companies that are here and what space sustainability means to them. So let me introduce our panelists and to celebrate uh, their willingness to come and share and to use no slides, but to share a few things they want you to know about their companies. First, I'll introduce Charity Whedon, who is Vice President for Global Space Policy at Astroscale US, coordinating and synchronizing Astroscale's global policy efforts towards spaceflight safety and long-term space sustainability. She's a 23-year veteran of the Royal Canadian Air Force, was previously Senior Director of Policy at the Satellite Industry Association, and also has formed her own consulting business, Support the Space Industry. Her background is in mechanical engineering, and she has a master's degree in space science as well. Thank you so much for being here. I'll also introduce uh, Vivek Vitaldev, and he is the lead for Orbit's R&D at Planet. 
and he has been there for four years, responsible for flight dynamics, mission design, mission planning, and scheduling of planets, large heterogeneous, heterogeneous constellation of Earth observation satellites. His background includes aerospace engineering uh, from several universities, including uh, where we are sitting today, UT at Austin. Uh, I'll also go then next uh, to my next page of my notes <laughs> and introduce uh, Matt Shoup, Director of Commercial Space at Leo Labs, where he leads business development and go-to-market strategy for the company's orbital tracking and collision prevention services. Uh, background in engineering physics from Henry Riddle, as well as the space studies program at ISU. And thank you so much, Doug Englehart, for also being here, uh, representing Maxar and has a lot of experience in the previous iteration under the name Digital Globe. Has uh, a lot of experience from that uh, period, uh, really helping to kind of create the market that we see today for communication and for commercial satellite imaging companies. And he's also been very involved with the commercial integration cell at the Combined Space Operations Center at Vandenberg. His background includes uh, aeronautical engineering, if I'm reading correctly. And uh, that's also from Purdue, so thank you so much. So I'm really glad to have all of you. My goal here, I'm gonna take a seat and join our panelists. We're gonna go through a few questions and invite rapid fire responses from the panelists so they share their ideas with you. And perhaps if you disagree with somebody, please feel free to jump in. Or if you wanna share an, an alternative view, please do. Uh, and we'll talk about what space sustainability means for these commercial players, uh, as well as what their thoughts are on the opportunity to have a space sustainability rating that helps us communicate the role of industry. Uh, but please plan your questions. We want to spend plenty of time with dialogue with the audience, so I'll be coming around with the microphone in our second half. Thank you so much. So as I join you all here, uh, let me f first start by asking. We have, of course, two different kinds of companies here. We have uh, two that operate uh, satellites for a business model focused particularly on producing value, uh, in this case through imagery. And we have two that are thinking about uh, the parts of the commercial system that actually serve the need of space sustainability. So I want to ask each of you, uh, I'll start with Charity and we'll kind of work our way down, but I'll ask each of you to talk about what it means to define space sustainability within your company and some of the key things you want the audience to know that your company is doing in support of this mission. Sure. Thank you, Danielle. Um, first, thank you to Mariba, to, <laughs> to everyone, and uh, for inviting me here uh, today. Uh, there, I'm, I'm a little nervous because there are some space traffic management giants in this room, and I've learned from each and one of you over the uh, past couple decades from stochastic modeling of brightness of objects over solar declination. Did I get that right, Matt? Great. Um, to, to how to think of the space environment in a new, fresh way, to debates on the legal issues of space traffic management, to understanding what you know, NASA's doing and how they're, they're involved in this. Uh, even I've, I've leveraged the knowledge in this room to select the telescope that my kids would use and the night sky and interact, so thank you, TS, for that. Uh, <laughs> so um, Astroscale is a global company solving a global problem, and really this is a global problem of space debris and making space sustainable for future generations. Astroscale's model is to make sure that uh, we have the technology the business imperative and the policies set in place to both mitigate space debris and remediate it. And what we're doing in this space is essentially in the mitigation piece, um, building out technology to uh, attach to defunct satellites that would be pre-engineered with a docking plate on them. And we would come up and attach them magnetically, get them out of harm's way, if they're not operational and uh, under um, active deorbit uh, uh, scenario, we would we would uh, bring that down underneath human spaceflight um, orbits and have them uh, burn up upon entry. The second piece of Astro Scale is the remediation piece, and that involves going up and doing the same thing. However, the object is not built with um, debris mitigation in mind. There may not be a grappling plate of some sort. And so it, it requires perhaps different technologies to um, uh, attach to it. But the same concept there of rendezvous and proximity operations, 
uh, the approach, the guidance and navigation, that can all be duplicated into the ADR scenario. So how do we think about space sustainability? Well, um, there was a great IAC paper by Darren McKnight and Tim McClay that talked about space situational awareness as foundational to two key practices. One is space traffic management or coordination, the behaviors and the rules, and the other is space environmental management. What can we do to um, actively uh, change the environment to our benefit so it can be sustainable. And out of that emerges uh, space operations insurance. I think that's a really good model to think about that way. Astroscale plays in the space traffic management piece in that we are in lively debates across the world on what it means to be a responsible space actor and trying to drive those best practices, but also in the mitigation and the remediation piece. Um, yeah, thank you all for giving me the opportunity to be on this panel. Um, from Planet's point of view, you know, our main product is our imagery and we like to make, use it to make the world a better place. But at the, at the same time, we don't want to make space a worse place by putting our satellites in. So space sustainability, you know, is a very important thing for us. And um, the things we kind of try to do to keep space sustainable from the point of view of our satellites is to be as open and transparent as possible. So we have you know, tracking on our, all our satellites. We do our own orbit determination. We share all our data on our own website, but with also multiple other sources like the SDA, uh, you know, Mariba's astrograph. And we, deal, we work with a lot of researchers at other universities and give them our data when they want it. So that's, that's us. Hi everyone, Matthew Shoup with Leo Labs. Uh, so just a little bit of background about us. We are a commercial company. We are about three years old. And our mission uh, as a company uh, really uh, is accurately described by the, the notion of space sustainability. Uh, we recognize the fact that historically speaking, there has been a bit of a gap in the amount of data, the good quality data about what's actually going on up there, uh, objects in space, and particularly in Leo. Uh, that is where we specialize at, uh, so we track with our network of ground-based radars, uh, objects generally between around 300 to 2,000 kilometers in altitude. Uh, and this calendar year, uh, as we build out our next radars, uh, we will start to uh, do our first initial scans of small debris. Uh, we've talked about small debris and uh, these types of uh, conferences for a number of years, uh, and we're actually finally getting close now to being able to start tracking some of that. Uh, and so it's a pretty exciting time for us. Uh, you know, and when it comes to, you know, how we view space sustainability, uh, we want to kind of bridge that gap between uh, the, what we know is up there, which is, you know, hundreds of thousands of objects, many of which are, you know, down to one or two cent centimeters in size, that if they were to hit a satellite, it would be a catastrophic collision and not only knock out the satellite, but generate more debris. We aren't tracking virtually any of that. That's historically speaking, objects below 10 centimeters in size has kind of been that threshold. So uh, that's very important when we're talking about keeping our space environment sustainable. All right? We have to, as others have said uh, in, in previous sessions here, we have to first know what's up there and we have to track it and, and we have to track it well. So that means you know, low covariances, track uh, these small debris objects multiple times per day from geographically distributed sensor networks and then make data that is usable to, to users. Uh, that, that's very important. Uh, as we scale up and uh, you know, the, we have a basically an order of magnitude increase in the number of satellites in LEO over the next few years. Uh, there's more and more data that's going to be available, so uh, we have to be careful to not overburden uh, operators, and we can, we can accomplish the mission of providing more data, but make it easier to ingest, and so it frees up time for operators to do other things. And so in that regard, I think there's, you know, several moving pieces there, but uh, we have to, you know, work to uh, prevent collisions in space from happening. That's you know, kind of a, a no-brainer, no essentially. And that really starts with tracking what is up there as accurately as possible and being able to provide that data to those who need it to make better choices. All right, I'm with Maxar Technologies. Uh, I'm in the division of Maxar Digital Globe, formerly Digital Globe uh, by itself. We fly four high-resolution imaging satellites um, for the past 20 years. So our primary... Uh, 
focus on space sustainability is preventing collisions, preventing debris causing events. Uh, potentially, we look at uh, space sustainability as active debris removal, cleaning up what's up there, but right now at this point, it's really about uh, not making things worse. So uh, one thing that differentiates us compared to Planet, uh, we only have four satellites. They're large, from 1,000 to 2,000 kilos each. Uh, so in the navigation systems in Maxar, uh, when we're approaching a uh, threatening object, you know, the, the way I, what comes into my mind is not typically, you know, debris and, 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 and having a collision. Uh, I see the faces of my coworkers. <laughs> uh, it's very personal with, we're, uh, you know, just a commercial company for satellites. If we lose one of our satellites, uh, we, it's a significant uh, hit to our revenue. So that affects the livelihood of, of my coworkers. So that's, that's what comes into my mind. And, uh, you know, we do everything we can to avoid that. Uh, these threatening conjunctions we have are typically uh, not with other satellites. For example, there's, there's lots of doves up there, but they're well tracked. It's not hard making a decision on those. Uh, the errors are, are pretty small. Uh, it's the sparsely tracked debris, you know, and large uncertainties. So as a navigator, you know, we're looking at it. Uh, do we move? Do we not move? We need more observations. We need more determination of, of, uh, of, of where the object is. So more accuracy is what we're looking for. So we don't want to move if we, could, if we would possibly make things worse because the uncertainties are so high. So that's the kind of stress that, that, that we deal with. And uh, that, that brings us to the... Um, into the arena of collaboration. Uh, I believe that's really the key to, to solving this problem. Not, not one single entity is, is gonna be able to solve it. It's too big. Uh, so that's, that's where we are. We're collaborating really where the sensors are. Uh, you know, we collaborate with Leo Labs. Uh, of course, we collaborate with the 18th. Um, the sensors are the beating heart of the space domain awareness system. So. Uh, getting more accuracy is really the key, as well as uh, getting operators to participate. So we're involved in, in as much as the adv advocacy for that as we can. Thank you all so much. I'm going to take an opportunity to allow all of you to watch while I do some stakeholder end-user studies, <laughs> because actually, in a sense, all of you are a stakeholder for our process of developing the space sustainability rating. And I'd love to have your advice on some of the choices we can make. Just for awareness, uh, the team that comes together to make the rating is in a process now of technical design, meaning we have to figure out what kind of questions can we ask a generic satellite operator, which could be a new university operator, could be an experienced fleet operator, could be somebody that has a few satellites or many. We want to have well-known and publicized questions that we're going to ask people about their choices. Some of the choices are done before they launch, some are during operations, some are end of life. So we've been brainstorming all kinds of fun questions, and we've been trying to figure out what kind of questions would best both be answerable <laughs> and would give us the right information about how that team is doing their best to reduce space debris. So I want to start by talking to the operators, so starting with Vivek and Doug and ask you, from your point of view, thinking about some of the choices that you and your colleagues get to make uh, during the early design phase of a mission, when you even you're deciding you know, what priorities will we put in terms of our business and what kind of services we're providing, and how does that translate into orbital selection and numbers of satellites? That's one phase of decision making. Later, there's the detailed engineering process where choices are being made around the kinds of physical characteristics of the satellite that can also have an impact on um, debris creation or avoidance. Later, there's operational decisions and of course, end of life. What advice would you like to give uh, that can help say, uh, when we put these different characteristics within the rating system, or if we ask about these different features, how will that help to encourage uh, possible adoption of responsible choices? This is uh, your opinion, <coughs> and of course, you can choose whether it's representing the company or not as you speak. Um, so start with okay, I think, um, in my opinion, I, it'll probably be good to have a lot of the companies kind of involved in coming up with the questions themselves because, you know, uh, 
probably a company wouldn't want to answer those questions if they end up being rated badly or poorly because of that. So I think that's, you know, in the kind of question generation phase, it's probably a good idea. And then also to have like a very good um, clear rubric of how the questions map to the rating, which would be, you know, I'm sure that's part of the design, but I think those are important uh, criteria, in my opinion. Can you say a bit more, perhaps, about any of these phases, whether it's the um, design phase, the operational phase, end of life phase? Yeah. What stands out to you as important? So I think the, you know, and I guess my day-to-day -day experience is mostly with the operational phase of once the satellites are in orbit. Um, yeah, so there's, I'd say kind of being, having the, um, you know, good kind of standards established just for the general public, but also internally in the company is important. And then, um, yeah, just being very open about where things are and what your plan is with satellites when they're done. I think that's, uh, that's a big, big one. <laughs> Thank you, Doug, do you wanna jump sure, in? Sure, two things. Uh, first, I would like to see the SSR as a platform to uh, incentivize use of standards. Uh, top on the list for standards would be uh, participation in the uh, conjunction assessment system in the way that the owner operators are providing trajectories to the central repository to be screened against the catalog. Not only just trajectories, but trajectories that contain maneuvers. Not only maneuvers, but uncertainties of their trajectory has been, has been mentioned many times today, the covariance. <clears throat> but even going further, not only the covariance, but the metrics that show the validation that their covariance is realistic. Every owner operator is, you know, there's a lot of different factors that go into calculating that uncertainty, uh, depending on how they're maneuvering. Uh, the frequency of maneuvers and the type of maneuvers and, and their own tracking and all of that should be represented in their covariance that's, uh, that's realistic and we should know that uh, and that should be available. Second, um, half of everything up there is from Russia or China. So if you can develop the rating in a way to incentivize Russia, China, India, to participate fully, then it has a chance of success. Thank you so much. I'll just, if, I, if you don't mind, I'll respond to some of the great ideas. First, I'll ask if my colleague Miles is in the room, is taking notes. <laughs> He's just uh, give some credit to the graduate students who make work happen sometimes. We've been uh, brainstorming with our students as well to think about uh, these points. I love the way you answered that question because you gave a list. You said you can start by giving just you know, one piece of information, but if you give A and B and C, it gets even more useful. And it really reflects how we're trying to think about this because we understand that operators will have different capabilities to answer these questions. So if we give some credit for answering a little bit, but a lot more credit for answering more completely, uh, that's a great, I th we think that's a great way to, to move. Uh, thank you so much for highlighting uh, the need for global dialogue. I just want to give appreciation uh, to Jean-Michel and to the uh, International Academy of Astronautics. One uh, direction they've been encouraging is just helping us think about uh, how to use the leverage of the international network, such as IAA, to, to better communicate and better coordinate. So I look for more ideas on that, but I, we definitely agree that it's a key issue and that um, it's, we are not meaning to represent our governments. We're representing the global space community and all of these important, important networks. Thank you so much. Does anyone want to comment on what Doug highlighted? If not, I have questions for, for Charity and Matt. Uh, so then, great, so uh, coming back now, if we look at uh, the business models that we're hoping to become more and more common, right, uh, on the side of tracking better and, of course, potentially a long-term uh, business market for uh, ADR, uh, what you, there's also a place for your stories uh, in the safety sustainability rating because we're also wrestling with, well, how do we know how much credit to give someone if they do uh, actually contract with uh, companies to get better data or to get services? And I'd love to hear your thoughts back to me. You can tell me whatever you think I should need to know about the best way to account for uh, the choice by an operator to work with you all. How should that give them additional credit in the space sustainability rating? Piggybacking off of what, uh, what Doug said, you know, it, it should be, um, you know, we should encourage 
uh, especially the, the younger, newer operators, to, to do things that can, can help with this, this rating that are, that are fairly easy boxes to check, I think. And now some of them will be much harder to do. But um, one of the things that uh, you mentioned was, uh, you know, knowing where your own satellite's at, sharing your ephemeris uh, with covariances uh, openly with the public. Right, that, that alone is, is, is huge. Um, and we can also, you know, look at, you know, there are, there are several uh, kind of categories that that can fall into in terms of accuracy, right? You have TLEs at the bottom, and then you have, uh, you know, uh, sensor tracking solutions, which can get you to maybe, you know, 100 meters, 200 meters kind of thing. Then you can have precision GPS OD that can get you like centimeter level. And is maybe there a tiered kind of system there for like how accurately, you know, you, you can track. And the better you are, the, the better your rating is. And of course, there's a verification piece that goes along with that too. Uh, on our side, do you want to say more about the verification piece? I'd love to hear that. Well, yeah, on on our side, um, you know, so so we we track every object that we can see in space uh, in in Leo. That includes satellites, that includes debris and everything. Uh, and we we have a, a whole system for uh, you know calibrating our measurements and our uncertainties and making sure that they're that they're realistic. Uh, we do that by means of a set of uh, uh, measuring a set of reference objects with known truth solutions like the ILRS satellites and a few others. Uh, and we, we're very transparent about this too. Uh, we, uh, we continuously, our automated system continuously updates our uh, radar biases and residuals and we publish this stuff openly on our website. So anyone can go see the current accuracies and uncertainties of our own sensors. Uh, and so if someone is using us to track their satellites, for example, which is something that we offer now, as a, either a primary tracking service if you don't have onboard telemetry or something, or as a backup service, um, things go wrong. Uh, I think it was Victoria who mentioned uh, with constellations, you know, if you launch a thousand satellites and you have a 2% failure rate, you know, that's a, a reasonable number of satellites that aren't transmitting a signal. So what do you do at that point? So we can, it doesn't make a difference to us whether it's transmitting a signal or not, we're still gonna measure it the same. So if someone is using uh, us as a service, for example, to track their satellites, that calibration box can already be checked because we have, you know, openly shared how we calibrate our data and we have a bunch of, uh, you know, reference information to provide from that. So that takes a lot of time and burden off of the operator and potentially makes things easier. First, I'd like to frame the SSR in a way that I feel is powerful. Um, and I'm gonna sh share some inside baseball here. At the last meeting uh, at, around IAC, uh, we got together and we talked about the SSR. We went through scenarios, and at the end of the meeting, um, I'll credit this to Tim McClay, again, from OneWeb, standing up and saying, we need to incentivize on the positive side. This needs to be like a restaurant rating, a health code rating of a restaurant. So just consider this. You walk up to a restaurant, you want to try it out, you look in the window, it has a certificate, it has a big C on the side. Do you want to go in? They're safe. I mean, they got the rating. Maybe, maybe not. How about if it has an A on it? It, it doesn't, that, just because it has the, an A on it doesn't mean it's incentivizing you to, you know, it has a great chef or what have you. What if it has a Michelin star on the side of the window? Or two, or three? Yes. That would draw customers. That's above and beyond. That's a, that's a, uh, a you know, a very uh, lucrative kind of level to attain. It's the best of the best. I would love to see a race to the top. I would love to see carrots rather than sticks apply to the SSR, and and have it think thought about that way. Um, I understand it's a very complicated. Um, kind of uh, decision and technology, you know, trying to, you know, map out and, and build algorithms and, and all this, but it also needs to be simple because if you don't know how the sausage is made, you won't necessarily trust the outcome. Uh, so keeping it s simple yet effective, that's, you know, that's a hard thing to do and, and we realize that. Um, but just on the note of, of international participation, just the little things like, you know, delivering this in multiple languages, making it accessible uh, or, or cloud-based so you don't have to access, you know, some, some machine over here that you're not allowed to go to. So there's, there's fundamentals here, and, and I, I appreciate it. It is a difficult thing to do. There's a lot of 
uh, inputs you're probably getting from operators, from those that are more bullish on, on uh, uh, responsible behavior. Um, and so just wanted to bring that idea of carrots rather than sticks. And let me just give you the opportunity too, because we literally this week we'll have meetings on this question of what are some of the concrete things that um, we could reward operators for that make them more serviceable, even if they are not sure if they're going to be serviced in the future. What do you recommend operators consider low cost, medium cost options they can take during the early design phase to give themselves the option of servicing in the future? Well, it's it's rather simple is, is thinking of from cradle to grave of your satellite, once you send it to orbit and it's operating, it's not hands off anymore. Owning that uh, technology until it, it is no longer in the way of other active satellites is important. So when you do those trade-offs, you want to have a low barrier, barrier entry to make it the most safe at the end of the at the end of its life. And our solution is lightweight, low cost, just in case, put a docking plate or some sort of grappling mechanism, s standardize it, right? Like it'll be easier for everyone and, and cheaper if something like that is standardized. You wouldn't necessarily buy a car without, you know, you know, the basics like, you know, trailer hitch on it. That's essentially what this is. And so trying to think of satellites in a new way, standardizing equipment and designing it before it launches, I think that's an improvement. And do you want to comment? So there was a shout out earlier highlighting the relationship Astra Scale has with the Japanese government. Do you, do you want to take a moment on that? Sure. Since I don't yeah. want to miss the opportunity for no, you to film no, that news. No, no, very exciting. Um, uh, Dr. Stowell mentioned uh, earlier today, you know, we're just, we're just all talk, we're not doing anything about it. No, that's not right. Uh, I think we're starting to do some things. I think we're moving from talk to action, and it's evidence in JAXA uh, uh, awarding the, um, uh, the, the, um, the ADR mission, CRD, CRD2, um, and what this will be is a, it's a, just a one phase out of a two phase project. The first phase is to go up and inspect to understand, to characterize a, um, a tumbling or rotating uh, upper stage rocket body. And this is really important. This is a step towards um, a future sustainability uh, in space. And so, uh, yes, I feel, you know, JAXA, the European Space Agency, has an active degree removal program as well. They're starting to become action. We're going to have our first demo later this year. We're going to test out the, the docking plate and the magnetic technology in the rendezvous. Um, so, and we're starting to see a bigger community of honor with servicing under which we're in that umbrella and that industry coalescing and starting to come together and talk about standards like confers was brought up earlier as well. I do have a hard question for all of you and I want to say it's in the spirit of intellectual inquiry and actually wanting your help. And I'll say it's to all of you and I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but I want to ask uh, for all the emerging technologies that we need to develop. How do we balance, from, from the SSR's point of view, we might say, oh, is an operator using an emerging technology? It has potential to be both risk reducing, but also potentially risk increasing if in its early phases, it's still unknown. We haven't yet um, demonstrated it. We would like to see it be useful in the future. This is relevant to ADR, but it's also relevant to the broader set of whether we're talking about uh, using algorithms more for um, kind of changing orbits or whether we're talking about uh, novel propulsion systems for small satellites. So for all these areas, uh, one area we're struggling with inside the SSR team is we do want to reward innovation. <laughs> we want to reward uh, teams that are going to try to give space heritage to new technologies. But we also ask for a particular mission, is that particular mission more risky or not if they're using innovative new technology? I'd love to hear your advice because this is truly an honest question. We would like to be able to contribute to better technology of getting it matured, but also be honest about risks. Anyone can, can comment. <coughs> For example, what emerging technologies are you thinking of? Uh, which Some of you have emerging technologies. You can comment on your own. Uh, yeah. my, <laughs> my team's developing uh, or exploring the opportunity for a low-cost uh, wax-based propellant for small satellites. They're in the very early stage. This was the uh, development for multiple years. But it's a case where we get to ask, you know, what opportunities will there be for lower-cost options for small satellites? Uh, to deorbit themselves, and maybe just by a simple deorbit uh, module instead of an entire propulsion system. These are examples. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting example of a dedicated, right? Um, it would, and I'd 
be interested in hearing your in input on this. So I'm hearing both camps of a drag shoe can quicken and speed up the deorbit process, but it's a large uh, RCS, uh, so it would be attract more pieces of debris being hit. So I'm not sure how you're rating that, and I'd love to hear what Vivek yeah. has to say. Uh, yeah, the drag one's a good one. So we, you know, we've kind of drag is a very vital part of operations for the doves since we've done differential drag successfully to actually phase out the things. So. Um, uh, we actually, our satellites, when they stop working at the end of their life, they go into tumbling mode, which is by default, which is a high drag mode for them. So we, in a way, use the drag to also help ourselves the orbit. Um, but yeah, the, the drag shoot is a good one. I don't think we've actually ever thought of that one. Um, and then in terms of kind of the um, merging technologies, so we've been working with Leo Labs for a long, long time. We even, um, you know, Back in 2017, we had a paper where we did this kind of orbit determination um, benchmarking, you know, using some of the Dove GPS with Leo Labs measurements. So I think we're definitely, and in the past for other um, kind of pieces of technology, we've done tech demos since, you know, we have a very smooth operation that's a well, like a well machine building a lot of satellites. So um, yeah, I think that's, um, that's something we're definitely have participated in in the past and I think is an interesting thing to do in the future. It sounds like your business model enables innovation, meaning you can build it into your normal business process. It's not an extra thing you're doing, you yeah. just put it into your next generation of satellites, you learn from it and you change. Yeah, it's exactly. They, they need to be it. getting better in every build. Um, other comments? I'm coming to the audience soon, so please plan your <laughs> questions, but other comments on this one? Yeah, I would say um, you know, on the, the example of the drag uh, shoot, for example, uh, is that is that more harm than good, or you know, what is the trade-off there? Uh, I would say uh, it's it's kind of exciting to see uh, some of the, the complementary nature of some of these new companies that are here, uh, us, Astroscale, uh, and satellite operators, where we can each kind of help the other one uh, do something here or there. So, like that example, we have tools that can simulate you know what that change is going to do, and we can run you know simulations and say, okay, by increasing increasing the the uh, surface area of this thing over a shorter period of time, how does that affect the collision risk overall? And we can, you know, we can work to weigh those options out. Uh, you know, other, other examples are, um, you know, we aren't, Leo Labs isn't directly in the ADR business, but um, our data certainly supports that, that notion. Um, events like the one that, uh, you know, got traction a few weeks ago between IRIS and GGSC4, uh, where uh, you know, it was, you know, a defunct satellite, you know, going to come very close to hitting another defunct satellite. Uh, and you know it it really highlights the risk of a lot of the defunct objects up there that aren't maneuverable and really need a, a solution like that. So I think it's uh, overall it's very encouraging to kind of see these complementary uh, you know uh, components of uh, different companies where one can kind of support the other. That's really helpful. I just want to give credit also to the ESA team and to Sten and Francesca Lizia who's not here and. I'll just highlight that one of the angles is that whenever we can model something, especially with uh, ESA's team's experience, we will, for the SSR, we'll try to put a mathematical uh, an evaluation of it. Some things can be modeled and you can estimate the risk based on that. Other things are more based on a kind of a qualitative data exchange. So really we're gonna end up with a mix of information that can be physically modeled, that actually has a probability analysis, and other things that are based on qualitative pieces. But part of the idea is that new technology will even give us better modeling capability in the future, which is great, thank you. Um, Experimental methods are good. I think you should incentivize those. However, uh, I don't think that should in any way detract from incentivizing the basics, which, you know, the basic technologies that are right there now, which are maybe kind of bland and boring, but participating with the 18 space, for example, fully participating. In, and the other things we mentioned about providing, providing trajectories. Um, as far as experimental methods, there, there's a stipulation that we um, had uh, put into the Space Safety Coalition's best practices for space sustainability, and that is that any CubeSat operator or, or uh, uh, low-cost um, mission operator, it's experimental and such, uh, that cannot uh, participate fully in collision avoidance, is not able to maneuver their satellites, for example, uh, is free to launch, but launch at 400 or under. Uh, it's under the ISS. 
And that's a, a region that if there's a mishap, something happens, everything comes in pretty quickly, and you're not endangering or not, shoulder, not pushing off the responsibility to everyone else 400 kilometers and above. So that's a great example, right? So we see one body coming together to say, we state this as an aspirational advice statement. We, we believe this is the right thing to do. And what a rating can do is say, if you follow that advice, we give you a, a sort of a you know, credit and a reward for that. So these are nice parallel pieces where one group is sort of writing down a, a good, strong best practice. Another group can come in and say, when people follow that best practice, they will be rewarded or celebrated. So it's a great um, example where uh, we can together push on that advice and, and support it together. Thank you. Well, good. I want to ask, is there someone? Ah, thank you, Marbeth. So I would love to open it up to the audience. Uh, and we can go ahead and invite you into this conversation for the next 15 minutes. Thank you so much. We'll start with uh, Dr. Hayduck, of course. I agree that <coughs> carrots are more desirable than sticks. But as a parent, I ran into the limits of the carrot method of discipline. Um, let's take as an example a prominent current mega constellation space actor who's posing some real safety challenges. They use non-Keplerian orbits, which can't really be solved for traditionally. The ephemerides they publish are extremely short. The navigation is on board. And the entire system works only if every other participant of every other active payload provides ephemerides to the 18th in a timely manner. So that this one group of, of actors, this one mega constellation can respond properly. What positive incentives could we have given them that would have put them on a different path? That is a wonderful question. I would love to open it up to my community. <laughs> and I'm happy to comment, but I, I'm not going well, to hug the mic. The rating system hadn't been developed when that system was designed. But as it comes online, I believe that operator would not want to get a low rating. I, hopefully. Isn't that the idea? What I'll say is Peer that um, our team, I, I just I already mentioned this, so we regularly have had uh, several events, we being the consortium that's developing the SSR, have had several events where we make a point uh, to always invite representatives of the major, uh, larger constellation operators. Everyone ha has been able to join and dialogue with us, so this is definitely happening in a, a two-way dialogue process. And um, I think that overall I would say I'm excited that I do see um, interest from all sides, basically, in, in the idea of doing our best. I think part of the reality of the SSR is you can choose which path you prefer. You can choose to take some paths rather than others. Um, but I do think, I hope, uh, that there'll be some fun race to the top that you talked about, that there'll be a sense that uh, as people start to actually demonstrate and have ratings published, it'll e even be a stronger sort of push. But I would also, one of the questions I was going to throw out to everyone is that uh, we, the SSR community, as well as uh, all of you as commercial teams, we don't expect any one solution to solve everything. So we hope also our team to um, be a tool that governments can use. Uh, it's possible in the future, if a government wanted to, they could take some or all of the SSR and apply it as part of their review or regulatory process. And all of you could also propose ways that there can be collaboration across uh, sectors. But other comments to the question? I, I welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the SSR, in my viewpoint, is meant to be the Michelin star. So, so maybe this entity doesn't want one, then that's fine. So what's the bottom? What is the baseline? Regulators set the baseline. And there are two things that motivate industry to act. One is regulations, and one is the bottom line. And so how do you influence either of those at the bottom to bring the bottom up and have them reach for the top, if you will. Um, one thing that was interesting about the SSC, if you read it uh, carefully, one section talks about selecting launch providers based on, uh, or, or recommending selecting launch providers based on their uh, responsibility. And so the power of the purse is very uh, a palpable thing here, I think. Um, but also, you know, we're seeing in the U.S., looking at regulations, the FCC, uh, what have you, um, are looking at what is that bottom line, too. So having that dialogue there is good. Thanks so much for mentioning the role of the launch providers. I want to see if anyone else has comments on that, but I have some thoughts. Yeah, I would, I would just say uh, that if, if we do, um, and we're sure to run into more automated, you know, 
uh, systems in the future, but um, you know the, the, the transparency there. If it's an automated decision making process, like what criteria are, you know, how, how do those algorithms work? Uh, how are those decisions being made? Uh, what's the inflection point of satellite decides to maneuver or not maneuver? And and you know be transparent with that so that the you know bad situation doesn't happen where you know, the automated satellite decides to move. The other satellite doesn't know that, and, and you know you have a kind of a gap in communication there. Anything you want to add, Vivek? We're, we're happy. <laughs> sure. Thank you. So I've heard of this uh, discussion seems to be focused on satellite operations and, and some of the supporting services, but you know I've heard Darren and McKnight's name mentioned a number of times, and, and he's definitely. Um, highlighted the fact that some of the largest risks are associated with the derelict rocket bodies and the clusters of these larger objects that are ultimately defunct. So if we're going to talk about a space sustainability rating for operating these spacecraft, you know, what is the resulting or comparative penalty of leaving a rocket body, especially with the mass uh, operations that are expected coming forward? We're going to be leaving a lot more rocket bodies out there, and is that perhaps maybe even even bigger problem that's going kind of overlooked in this discussion? Well, I believe that that's folded into the selection of the launch provider. So there'll be a rating for the selection of the, uh, of the launch provider on wh whether they leave mass in orbit or not. So that goes into the rating. It's ultimately the operator that gets rated, correct? So. It's up to the operator to make decisions on the design of their satellite and, and, uh, and the selection of the launch vehicle. I'd also add that um, the, the SSR, and it's under revisions and, and looking, being looked at, but is your rating may be set before you go up instead of at the end of the life and, and you actually have validation, you've actually done all these steps, that you've actually uh, uh, deorbited your rocket body in time and, and passivate, uh, passivated it. Um, I would like to see conditional rating and then your final rating. And that might be that incentive as well. These are excellent questions and to be honest, with you, as we've been doing throughout today, people are sharing what's really going on in our work. So there's two pieces. One is that um, we are definitely focused on rating operators first and we've been asking ourselves what is the best way to include aspects of launch. For example, and anyone who wants to give me advice on this, one question is if you are a multi-operator launch, how exactly are the different operators who are customers of that launch um, sort of responsible for the debris left behind by that launch? So maybe you have one major uh, operator who buys a launch and they have some small CubeSats going with them. That's an interesting case where I assume the primary customer would have been the driver of choosing that rocket. Maybe the CubeSats just were lucky enough to get on. But what if you have six medium-sized satellites all sharing a rocket and they're all kind of the same uh, power or they paid the same price? At this point, actually, I'd we should explore what's the fair way to kind of distribute each of their responsibility uh, and then ask what's the role of the launch vehicle provider and of these different customers. This is a, a fun mental game we've been playing to figure out what's the best way to distribute the role. Um, and the other piece then is the question of uh, is your rating a once and for all rating? We've been ex asking ourselves the question as the SSR design team, uh, is it that we need to keep updating the rating over the life of the mission? Partly too, as, and that's why we wanted to talk about validation, part of it is asking, um, can we validate as your story unfolds that if you plan a certain level of responsibility that it is actually done? Uh, so we see a need both for, because things change and also because your plan will be known over time. So these are things we are literally debating and I love having your input on it, so thank you. And thanks for that great question about launch. It's an ongoing debate. Previous question uh, on automation. Uh, I believe this, the rating system should not de-incentivize de automation. Uh, automation in itself is not bad. Uh, in this case, I believe there could have been some, some decisions made earlier in the process so that their predicted ephemerities would be known ahead of time. So I think that's, that's a change that's needed uh, going, uh, going forward. But uh, commercial operators, were, if you ask the two operators here, we're completely automated. That's why we're able to be here. Uh, Vivek, how many trajectories have you, has your system computed since you've been sitting here? Probably. Yeah, yeah. working at I mean, like, you know, a handful of operators, so automation is definitely key. Yeah, yeah. So, 
um, but it's the decisions going into the automation to make it smart in this context is what the, the rating should incentivize. And so you're really highlighting, it's not just individual questions such as automation, yes, no, data sharing, yes, no. It's really that an uh, operator can make a choice. It's kind of a design process that has a logical conclusion that this combination of data sharing and design features and physical features and operational plans can make sense. There's many ways they could do it. And so we do hope to find or to celebrate as many positive examples that might be different from each other. Thank you. Oh. Because it would be, because uh, going back to Dr. Kelso's point earlier this morning about assumptions, you know, automation is just built on a lot of assumptions. So we should be incentivized to be open about those assumptions so that at least, you know, we're, we can be sure about our own assumptions, but also about other people's assumptions since they probably start affecting each other. We probably have time for one or maybe two more. So please uh, welcome the comments. Thank you for uh, excellent discussions. I have a question. Uh, I have here that uh, in near future, SSR will be uh, evaluated and certified by third party, third party organizations. What uh, suitable organizations for third party certification of SSR, especially for multiple languages and mul for multiple countries? Thank you. I will, again, uh, part of the fun is to hear your opinions about these questions. Um, so the question, to make sure everyone heard, uh, well, it's what I mentioned earlier is that there's a team designing the space sustainability rating, and we are not claiming to be the team that will operate it forever. We're claiming that we're going to be part of the design process to just define an organization, which maybe some of us will be involved with. So there is a need to develop an organization that can have a long-term, uh, sort of sustainable business model, whether it's for-profit or non-profit, and it has uh, the credibility to provide this kind of service. So again, uh, uh, drawing from <laughs> stakeholder input, uh, what would you say should be some of the key um, characteristics of an organization that can operate the SSR going forward? Probably the one of the most important characteristics would be that they are allowed to share maximum amount of information. So if it's from a a nation or an entity that is hamstringed, then probably not the right choice. Uh, I guess in uh, my opinion, also the kind of the ability to be flexible, like will the ratings be, or the, the rubric for the ratings, will that be made and then set in stone or is that something as time goes on, someone keeps appending and amending? Yeah, I would say that uh, as far as the, you know, who's looking at what's happening up there, um, commercial companies may have an advantage over government systems which have you know, sens cer certain sensitivities to them or things that they can't share, uh, whereas commercial entities um, with similar capabilities can be wide open and can report everything mm -hmm. they have kind of without restriction. Um, and then circling that back into the previous topic about uh, validation, is there an initial rating uh, that assumes a certain set of requirements are going to be met and, and then you, you check that box? Um, do we then follow up? over the next one, two, five years. And uh, that's kind of what we, um, that's something that we can do uh, at, at Leo Labs. And it's something, a, a similar example is something we set up uh, with the New Zealand Space Agency uh, recently, about a year ago now, I believe, uh, where you know, every launch occurring from New Zealand, uh, the, the, the payloads, the rocket body, et cetera, we, we track those and there's certain kind of expected compliance criteria that they set and we, we feed all of that data back into them. And if something is out of compliance and this thing you know, updates kind of in real time, then, then they see that and they can take an action appropriately. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think it's, I, I do agree that we want to incentivize the good behavior, but this can also, that follow-up can also help, you know, say, are they doing what they said they were gonna do? Or are they, are they maneuvering out of the way of risky conjunction events? Are they not maneuvering? And it's a good kind of check and balance. <clears throat> yeah, the same, that was what I was gonna add. That, uh, uh, there's, I know that this is under discussion, but you have the, the initial rating and then uh, the checks uh, at, at some interval. Uh, not that that has to be publicly disclosed, but it should go into the rating and the operators should understand that uh, how they're following through with what they said they were going to do or if they're adding new capability for, for uh, collision avoidance, um, then that should be uh, rewarded. So we're taking yeah. all of this type of thinking as we do the development. So I really celebrate, it's 
wonderful to have you kind of pointing out the kind of things we need to consider. I think we have time for one more question, and we'll, we'll close this out, and we'll have time for relaxing together. Okay, cool. Uh, this question for uh, Vivek from Planet and Doug from um, Vaxar. Um, so one, uh, Vivek, thanks for all that uh, ephemeris data you guys published. Uh, it can be a gold mine, uh, but as a researcher, I always want more data. Uh, so first question is, have you considered publishing known maneuvers? Um, in response to the questions I think Leo Lab just brought up with SSR, how that can play into it, have you considered publishing those? And then from Maxar, have you guys considered publishing really any ephemeris data to be publicly available? I'll go first, it's easy. Uh, yeah, we. We should probably publicize it, it better. I do like the way Planet, when you go to Space Track, uh, look in the directory, and then they have a, a link to their to their website that has every all of their ephemerities and, and states. Uh, I think we should do that as well. We have everything online. It's digitalglobe.com slash ephemeris. Yeah, so so you can see we put we put out uh, we've been doing it for 20 years. Every satellite, 30 day predicts that include maneuvers. <clears throat> uh, Baked into baked into the ephemerities, uh, so those are out there, um, and we provide those to 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 everybody we can. I mean, they go into Astrograph, uh, they go to the 18th, of course, they go into the SDC. Um, now, as far as maneuver data, we provide those maneuver data to the 18th, and uh, so other operators can see those maneuver data. Uh, operators are, are able to check a box that makes their data, the maneuver data, public. So other SSA sharing agreement holders that that are operators, you know, with access to space track, space track can see those maneuvers, and we can see we can see others in there as well. You know, we look at Iridium's maneuvers, for example. <clears throat> they're they're all in there under space track. Um, I think my answer will be. Pretty much similar. Uh, all our ephemeris that's published has maneuver data and well included in there. So when we give out the predicts on our website, it includes all maneuvers for sky sets and for the doves which are doing this kind of differential drag things. It includes the expected profile prediction. So um, yes, yeah, so all of that is already there. And then we do send our, you know, we also send this data to Space Track. So we we let the 18 know that we're doing a maneuver both in the ephemeris that we send them and also we send them a, a CCSDS uh, maneuver message. Um, so yeah, so these are things that we already share. I'm seeing a bit of a trend here um, and maybe it's turning into a practice for industry to share maneuver plans. Uh, ex example from Maxar and of course uh, the planet, but also in the confers best practices document uh, there is an indication in there that uh, confers members, that's the on over servicing community, will share maneuver information among each other, and perhaps uh, others will decide to share that publicly as well. And we're considering that uh, for our mission. So I, I think you've started a trend, uh, and that sharing maneuver information is a, a good practice for all satellite operators. Pat, do you want to say any f final words within less than a minute? To it's great uh, concurrence up here. Um, we, uh, as we build out our system, you know, we can you know, start to ingest some of this data that's being shared publicly. And you know, when we start tracking small debris uh, and start to make, you know, it, we talked about these iterative kind of, um, you know, uh, improvements and you know, pushing the envelope a little bit. Um, and so we can start to do that here soon. But yeah, I, I would fully echo uh, everything that's been said here. Uh, you know, doing simple things like knowing where your own satellite's at and sharing that information and doing that on a regular basis, uh, the more frequently the better, uh, so that the data always stays fresh. Mm -hmm. That alone is, and if we can agree where to do that and in what formats and everything, that alone is so helpful. And you know, if you're an operator, not only share your ephemeris, but publish your, your contact information for your operations team and your hours of availability and what time zone you're in and you know things like that, so that if a maneuver alert comes in at 3 a.m., somebody on call knows who to contact. Wise words. When the space sustainability rating is up and operating, all of you can say you attended the design meeting live on stage with a live stream. So thank you for your time today, and I look forward to relaxing with you. And thank you to our organizers.